For 15 years, there was one man and one nation that all of Europe feared, feared greatly. Under the rule of this man, he successfully conquered much of Europe, built himself an entire empire, and every single country he wanted, he simply took. And when I mean took, quite literally, he just took it. But on June 18th, 1815, this leader would fall, and the empire that he built would be defeated and crushed. And it all happened in a small town in Belgium at a place called Waterloo. The empire was France, and the leader was a man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, there have been thousands of battles that have taken place on the soil of Europe, but many historians point out that the Battle of Waterloo was one of the most consequential battles that was ever fought in Europe, and even one of the most consequential battles that was ever fought in all of the earth. And did you know that if it wasn't for just a few small mistakes made by Napoleon Bonaparte, all of European history and all of world history would be changed forever forever. Now, what were those mistakes that Napoleon made? Well, on June 17th, the day before the Battle of Waterloo, there was a torrential downpour. The water was coming down, and it soaked the battlefield of Waterloo. And Napoleon was planning to start his attack at 7 a.m. on June 18th, but he surveyed the battlefield and said, you know what, instead of June, 7, or instead of June 18th at, at 7 a.m., let's delay it a little bit, and let's start at 11 a.m., And he did just that. He thought maybe the drier ground would be an advantage for his uh, elite soldiers. But as it turns out, this mistake to delay the battle was one of Napoleon's biggest mistakes. Because what happened is, by delaying the battle to 11, it allowed the British forces that he was going to be attacking to be reinforced by the Prussian army. And when the Prussians got there, they were able to reinforce the Brits and eventually destroy the French army make Napoleon retreat. But if Napoleon would have started at 7 a.m. like he had originally planned on doing, he surely would have marched through the entire British army and then he would have been able to fortify his position and struck down the far weaker Prussian military. He would have destroyed both of them very simply. He would have marched into Brussels, they would have you know, slammed down the French flag and they would have been victorious, claiming pretty much every ground of Europe as their own. But as history shows, one mistake, good or bad, one decision, good or bad, can change history as we know it can change history as we know it. Now, of course, this is not just true for Napoleon. This is not just true for the French army back in 1815. This is, of course, true for your life and my life. Did you know that every single choice you make, every single decision that you decide on, carries with it certain consequences? Whether those consequences be good or bad, every single choice we make results in something And as humans, we make a lot of choices. We make a lot of decisions. In fact, Cornell University did a study a few years ago which found that we as humans make roughly 35,000 conscious or unconscious decisions a day. 35,000 choices you and I are making every single day. In other words, as humans, we are choice-making machines We do it so much that we aren't even aware of all of the choices and all of the decisions that we are making. But for our lesson today, here's what I want to do. I don't want to focus on the seemingly unimportant choices that we make. I don't want to focus on the small choices, right? Like the kind of tea we're going to have. If we're going to have decaf coffee or full caffeine coffee. I don't want to focus on on, on those kind of little small, seemingly insignificant choices that we make as humans. No, for our time today, what I want to focus on is the big choices, The big ones. Now, I think you know what I'm talking about. The big choices, the life-altering choices, the ones that have ripple effects all throughout our lives and that eventually will affect other people in our lives. I'm talking about, like, should we send our kids to public school, private school, or homeschool, right? Should I end up marrying this person, Should I break up with my boyfriend or my girlfriend? Should I call off this engagement? Should I go to college after high school or should I jump into a trade school or just go right into the workforce? Should I leave my current job for a different one? All of these questions and many more like these are questions that are constantly bouncing around in our head. I know another question that was bouncing around in a lot of our heads during the height of COVID is, should we pack our family up out of Oregon and move to a different state like Idaho or Texas? 
or Tennessee? What's the right choice? And the fact is, is that depending on what choice we make, depending on what decision we decide on, it can change everything in our life. In fact, I look back at some decisions that my parents made that changed everything about my future. When I was two years old, my parents decided to move from Salem back down to Grants Pass. My mom was from Grants Pass, went to Hidden Valley High School. She's one of seven siblings, and all of her family was down in Grants Pass. And they decided when I was two, when my older sister was three, that it would be good for us to move south and to be near family. That was a big decision, because the truth is, is that if my parents didn't decide to move from Salem back down to Grants Pass, who knows where my life would be? Odds are I would not have met my wife, Perhaps I would most definitely not be standing on this stage right now. Everything in my life would have been vastly different. Who knows if I'd even be married? Who knows what my life would look like? But the truth is, is that their decision not only impacted them, it impacted their kids. The choices we make have ripple effects through generations, folks. These kind of choices are big. Well, here in Numbers 13 and 14, what we're going to see is the nation of Israel making a choice that was stupid making a really dumb choice, okay, that had ripple effects through the generations. And the goal today is to show us and to teach us how we cannot make their same mistake. And so go ahead and open your Bibles and turn with me to Numbers chapter 13 today. Numbers 13, starting in verse 1, as you're turning there. Uh, last week, Pastor Mark was with us. Uh, some of, if you were here, you saw Mark. I love Mark. He's an incredible Bible teacher. I know some of you really loved him uh, because you walked up to me after service with your watches like this. And, and you said, do you see what time it is, Austin? And, and I said, I see exactly what time it is. And you said, it looks like I'm going to be able to make my lunch in time because we got dismissed 13 minutes early last week. Do you guys remember that? Not today, okay? <laughs> Not today, all right? Because here's the fact. I know what your lunch plans are. We have a potluck, and so you're strapped in, folks. Cancel the 1 p.m., all right? You're gonna be here, and you're gonna love it, okay? I'm just, I'm, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. No, it was funny, though. Mark, when he, when he went away, he's like, he's like, dude, that was such a short sermon. I'm like, these people are conditioned for 40-minute sermons, Mark. All right? It's just in their DNA at this point. And he said, you suck. And uh, so anyways, Numbers 13, Numbers 13, verse 1. Enough joking around. Here's what it says. Numbers 13, verse 1. It says this. The Lord spoke to Moses. He said, send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I am giving to the Israelites. Send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. So what is happening here? God is communicating with the nation of Israel. And he is saying, I want you to go to every single tribe of Israel. I need you to pick one man, a leader from each tribe, and I need you to get them and send them on a spy mission. Send them on a reconnaissance mission. Now, where is this taking place? Well, in Numbers 13, the Israelites are camped at a place called Kadesh Barnea. I think I have a picture of it or a map of it, here it is. So they're camped right here. It's on the border of the promised land. This is the promised region that God promised Father Abraham that he was gonna give the nation of Israel. And so in Numbers 13, God is saying, grab some spies, tell them to walk through the land, figure out where people are, figure out what's going on, and get a lay of the land. Now this journey would have been a 350 to 400 mile round trip journey. So these guys were gonna be walking a lot. On top of that, we are told that it was going to take them 40 days. So these guys were wandering through the land at quite a rapid pace, just sort of getting a lay for the land. What is going on? Well, let's see what happens in verse 17. Jump with me down to verse 17. When Moses sent them to scout out the land of Canaan, he told them, go up to the Negev, then go up into the hill country and see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Is the land they live in good or bad? Are the cities they live in encampments or fortifications? Is the land fertile or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? Be courageous. Bring back some fruit from the land. And it was the season for the first ripe grapes. So here, Moses is telling them, here's your mission. Here's what you need to do. Here's what I'm sending you to go accomplish. Get a lay of the land. See, are they Bedouins or are they massive armies? What's in our future? Verse 21, so they went up and scouted out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near the entrance to Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron. Keep that word in mind, Hebron. File it away because there's some fun stuff we're gonna chat about that. Where Ahaman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, 
were living. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And when they came to the Eshkol Valley, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, which was carried on a pole by two men. They also took some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Eshkol Valley because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut there. At the end of 40 days, they return from scouting out the land. So the 40 days are up and the spies are coming back with a bountiful load. It says that when they were in the Eshkol Valley, they cut down a cluster of grapes that had to be carried by two men. I don't know why, but in my mind, I picture these grapes the size of cantaloupes. (laughs) Just massive grapes, right? When you bite it, it takes you like 18 bites to finish one little grape. I don't know why, but that's where I go in my mind. But this land is incredible. This land is everything and more that God promised. Remember, God said it is going to be flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be a beautiful land, and I'm giving it to you guys. And that's what the spies see. They see that it's something special. They see that it is remarkable and that it was something that God was telling the truth about. But look at verse 26. The men went back to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community in the wilderness of Paran Kadesh, And they brought back a report for them and the whole community, and they showed them the fruit of the land. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey, and here is some of its fruit. So again, they roll up, and they are like, the land is good. I don't know why, but in my mind, I picture just sort of the crowd of people in the Israelite community just sort of being parted with the 12 spies walking in with dudes carrying armfuls of pomegranates and figs, you know, two guys carrying a massive cluster of grapes, and everybody's like, no way. That's what we have to look forward to. Can you imagine? One grape will be like an entire fruit smoothie. This is outrageous. This is going to be incredible. Surely everything God promised, that's in our future. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. The land is fruitful. The rivers run strong. The trees are tall. And it's going to be ours. But then look at verse 28. The positive report begins to go south. Verse 28. However, what a bad word. Let's just, let's just think about this for a moment. They walk in. I don't mean to spend too much time on this, but that word ticks me off because we just went from this place has great pomegranates, this place has great figs, this place has great rivers, everything is green, high trees, awesome. However, however, little wimps, the people living in the land are strong and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the land of Negev. The Hethites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. So they start their report by saying, it is good, it is everything God promised, it's magnificent, God was not lying, he's telling the truth. But then almost immediately after they get done saying how great the land is, they go, but there's a problem. There's a slight issue. You see, the land is great, but... It's impenetrable, it's massive, it's fortified. These aren't just little Bedouin people with with stick swords living in tents. This is the real deal. And to be fair to these people, they're telling the truth because archaeological explorations tell us that during this time period, some of the walls of these cities that these spies would have seen would have been as tall as 20 to 30 feet high and 15 feet thick. So these were not small little cities. These were not little tents that people were just dwelling in. These were legit empires. These were legit cities that were fortified. Not only were the walls high and tall and strong, they also saw really tall and strong warriors. They saw fighting men, powerful, strong fighters, men who looked like they were chiseled, right? battle-torn, battle-tested savages. Now keep in mind, the average Jewish man at this time would have been between the size of five foot three and five foot nine, okay? That would have been roughly the size of a Jewish man. We know this for a variety of reasons. One of the greatest telltale signs is that King Saul, who would later be the king of Israel, was a head taller than everybody else, and it's indicated that he was right around five, 10 to six feet tall, okay? So a tall, average-sized Jewish man would have been about 5'9". And in verse, or would have been, average size would have been roughly about 5'5", five five, maybe 125 pounds, right? Well, in verse, 20, in verse 28, look what it says. It says that they saw the descendants of Anak. 
They saw the descendants of Anak. Now, who is this? Well, that is in reference to the giants that are described in the book of Genesis during the time of Noah. We also see a race of giants in the life of David. In 2 Samuel 21, in this epic scene that is fit for IMAX theater, David takes his warriors and he wages war against a race of giants, some with six fingers, you know, on each hand, guys that were standing seven feet, eight feet, maybe even nine feet tall, and it's indicated that they had spears that were 25 pounds heavy. These guys were massive warriors, It's not, if you're, you know, if you're somebody who's like, well, that's what the Bible says, it's all fake. Well, the Egyptian records also describe the Anakim people as fierce and ferocious warriors. They fought this group, the Egyptians would fight this race of giants as well. And they have documents saying, these guys are legendary. They are tough, they are strong, they are brave. They are nothing to be trifled with. They are tough Dudes, And so they were perhaps seven feet, eight feet, maybe even nine feet tall. We're talking 300, 400 pounds. They obviously are fed well. They're living in a land that has plenty of resources. And you have to imagine that the big smiles on the Israelites' faces when they saw the pomegranates and the figs and the grapes probably turned to frowns real quickly when they heard about the tall walls and the tough guys. You have to imagine that they started to get a little bit intimidated, but all hope is not lost. Look at verse 30. There's a guy named Caleb, and he's a good dude. Look at verse 30. It says, then Caleb quieted the people. So everybody's complaining, right? They're like, oh, they're so tall. It's not going to be good. Then Caleb just kind of, I, I, I don't know why, but I envision a drum. Just bang, bang, bang. Listen, listen to me. This is Caleb. He says, he says, let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. Caleb is like, you guys got nothing to fear. God said it's going to be our land, and so let's go take it. It's a promise. He promised our father Abraham. I know the the, the walls are high. I know the people are tall, but our God's bigger. So let's just go. We got nothing to fear. Do you guys remember when he parted the Red Sea? Do you remember when he crushed the Egyptian army? Do you remember when three million of us got out of Egypt completely unscathed from the Egyptian army? Do you remember all the plagues that God sent on Egypt? I don't think we have much to worry. You're scared of a wall? God will send locusts and eat the dang wall. Like, we're good. Caleb is like, you guys don't have anything to worry about. Look at verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him responded, we can't attack the people because they're stronger than we are. So they gave gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they had scouted, saying the land we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants and all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers and we must have seemed the same to them. So again, they're like, you don't understand. These are tough people. Their walls are high, they're thick. The Israelite people are weak, they're fearful, and they're faithless. And notice how they say, we seem like grasshoppers to them. That is such an interesting phrase that they use there because you guys know this, words have power. And using a word like that to describe themselves as grasshoppers would have painted a mental picture in everybody's mind of something very significant that would have made them feel about this big, and I'll show you how. You see, grasshoppers were the smallest living creatures that were prescribed for the nation of Israel to be able to consume. So on their travels, the people of Israel could gather up grasshoppers, they could fry them, and then they could eat them, okay? They could eat grasshoppers. It was the smallest living object that the Israelites could eat. And so when the spies say that we are like grasshoppers to them, they are painting an image in everyone's mind that the people of Israel would be like finger food to all these giants, He's like, you know the way we view grasshoppers? Oh yeah, look at that, I'll just grab one. He's like, yeah, that's how they'd view us. We're weak, we're insignificant, we're small, they just flick us around, we're like little bugs to them. They would squash us and destroy us, no big deal. Now you know that this would have been rattling through the minds of some of these people going, holy cow, I am small, holy cow, I am insignificant, holy cow, I am weak. But what we're gonna see next is the most pivotal moment in many of these Israelites' life. It, in many ways, is the Waterloo moment. This is a defining moment in their lives. How are the people of Israel going to respond to this negative report? Flip to chapter 14, look at verse one. It says, Then the whole community broke into loud cries, and the people wept that night. 
All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and our children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a new leader and go back to Egypt. Friends, they failed. They failed. They made a decision just like Napoleon that would change their lives forever. And do you want to know one of the worst things about the decision that they decided to make here? Is that they have been given all of the tools, all of the evidence, all of the lessons, all of the resources, all of the guidance to make the right decision. God, just a few chapters ago, gave him tons of meat. He said, you want quail? I'm going to give you all the quail in the world. You want manna, this magical angel bread? I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna keep feeding you. I'm gonna keep you nourished. Oh, by the way, you don't know where to go? I'll be like a fire over you at night and a cloud by day, and I will guide you every step along the way. God has equipped these people to walk boldly into any situation he had called them into. But for whatever reason, these people shake and freak out, and they lose it. Friends, listen to me and listen to me very closely. When decisions like this when big decisions in our lives like this need to be made, we must do everything we possibly can to make the right decision. We must do everything we possibly can to make the right decision because what we're gonna see is that their failure to make the right decision and choose faith instead of fear is gonna result in massive consequences. They're gonna walk in circles for 40 years and none of them over the age of 20 are gonna walk into the promised land. They're gonna die in the desert. There's consequences. There are consequences. And so in this story, here's what I want to do. I want to show us some principles from this story that will inform us on how to make the right decisions, how you and I won't make the same mistakes that the people of Israel did. So let's do this. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. When making a big decision, reflect on past experiences and learn from them. Write that down. When making a big decision, reflect on past experiences and learn from them. This has got to be one of the main things that we learn from the people of Israel. The people of Israel have this remarkable ability to have short-term memory loss. God will do something spectacular for them. He will save them. He will renew them. He will do something special for them. And then immediately they'll turn and go the other direction. They just have this uncanny ability to go, oh, look, it, God saves us. Now I'm going to go do the opposite of what led me to God in the first place. They constantly are walking away from their God. They already know what the consequences for grumbling and complaining are. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Do you remember what happened with, uh, with, with Miriam and Aaron last week, grumbling and envy? She broke out in leprosy. There are consequences. But these people have thick skulls and they're foolish people. And it's one thing for us to kind of look at them and go, they're ridiculous, but here's the truth. This applies to us. Friends, a foolish person is somebody who goes through an experience in life, whether it be good or bad, and learns nothing. You hear what I'm saying? Nod your head if you, if you hear what I'm saying. Okay, good. A foolish person is somebody who goes through life, who goes through good or bad experiences, and learns nothing. That is a foolish person. At the very least, that is acting foolishly, right? That's acting very foolishly. And, and, and here's another thing about this. Okay, the, the, the 12 spies, let's freestyle for a moment. In your Bibles, turn, turn to Genesis 25. Go to Genesis 25. And let, let's, let's talk candidly for a sec. So these 12 spies that were walking through the promised land, can we throw that map back up there, Cherie, for a moment? Let's do that. So they're in Kadesh Barnea, and these spies are going to be walking through this entire region. Now, there's a lot of significance about this region. As I said, this is where Abraham lived. This is where Father Abraham had set up camp. Remember before they were taken into Egypt through Joseph, and they were saved from the famine? Before the, This was the area that Abraham lived. Now, Abraham was the man that God promised to make his descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky. He made this promise to Abraham. The nation of Israel is in fulfillment of this promise. They are on the border to walking into the promised land. Now, I told you to remember the name Hebron. Remember? I said, remember the name Hebron. Why is that significant? Well, Hebron is the place where they cut that cluster of grapes. Remember? Well, Hebron also has significance because in Genesis 25, we see that somebody significant is buried in Hebron. Abraham. Abraham is buried in Hebron, and so is his wife, Sarah. So just wrap your mind around this, guys. 
These spies are walking through the promised land and they would have been walking on the literal land where God had promised their descendants that he was gonna give this land to him. It would be like somebody walking on the Oregon Trail and being like, I just don't feel like this nation has much going on. I don't feel like it's, I'm just feeling depleted. There's not much hope for me. And then hopping on a train, going back to Washington, D.C. and going to the Washington Memorial, the Lincoln Monument and going, holy cow, there is significance to this country. They're walking through historical gold mine. They're walking through right by Abraham's tomb. Right across this land where Abraham was victorious, where Abraham was told by God that his descendants would come back to this land. In other words, these spies should have been walking back going, you guys, we saw Abraham's tomb. Remember, God made a promise to Abraham. We have no reason to be afraid. God promised it to Abraham. We believe it. We're right here on the boundaries. Let's go get it. Yeah. But instead, they just, nah, scared. They're fools. They don't learn from the past. They don't see that God's promise then is still relevant for them now. They have short-term memory loss, okay? Proverbs 26, 11 says, like a dog returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. By the way, that's Genesis 25, 7 through 11, where we see where Abraham's buried. Same region as Hebron. But a fool is someone who repeats his folly time and time again. I get grossed out by my dog when she eats gross things, and then I look at it and go, well, she's a fool, and... When I repeat my own folly, I'm also a fool. When I repeat my own folly, when I don't learn from my past mistakes and my past failures, that makes me a fool as well. And I don't think a single one of us in this room wants to be considered a foolish person. I know I don't. And so let's equip you. How can we not be a foolish person? Well, um, here's one suggestion, letter A. Identify patterns of behavior. You need to identify your patterns of behavior, okay? Okay. Identify patterns in your life that are consistently leading you to a place that you do not appreciate. Identify them. Now, this takes a little bit of self-awareness, and I'm going to hope that we're mature enough to recognize that in our own life. But we need to identify patterns of behavior. I'll give you some examples. Are you someone who has a roller coaster relationship with your finances? Maybe you're somebody who's self-employed or, or who works like a, a seasonal type job, and maybe one season you are making a lot of money, and then another season you're not making a lot of money. But for whatever reason, one of the issues in your life is this idea of money, and you're constantly struggling, and money is stressing you out. It's the number one cause for divorce, money issues. Well, friends, maybe the reason you get stressed out by money is because when you make a lot of money, you spend a lot of money. When you make a lot, you spend a lot of it. And uh, you purchase things that you have no business buying. You don't need another car. You don't need a jet ski. You don't need to buy a new TV or a new phone every year, right? Right? And perhaps you find yourself constantly getting stressed out by money because you repeat the same pattern over and over and over again. When I have money, I spend it. Well, maybe instead of spending it when you have a lot, you put some away and you save it. And you save it. Because you recognize that your budget kind of goes like this. Here's another one. I hear this one all the time with young singles, right? I can't find any good guys. I can't find any good girls, There's nobody that's marriage material. Well, here's a novel idea. How about, especially for young guys, how about instead of meeting a girl and having sex with her on the first day, you get to know her. You get to meet her. You get to converse with her in a way that you get to kind of know who she is as a person. And then instead of just having sex with her and sleeping with her and being like, oh, do I even like her? There's no good marriage material. Maybe you're not good marriage material and you stink. Maybe you're the dirtbag, right? Well, there's nobody out there who is worthy of marriage. Homie, you're not worthy of marriage. The pattern of your life is foolishness. So quit pointing the finger. Realize that the pattern that you are exhibiting is foolishness. I mean, we could could do this over and over and over again. There are so many toxic things that people will do time and time and time again thinking that there's going to be a different result. But that is textbook definition of insanity. We have to identify patterns of behavior because when we identify patterns of behavior, we'll be able to see the things that are leading us down a path that are pointless and fruitless by learning from our past mistakes. A wise person is someone who views the past and learns from it. A foolish person is someone who forgets the past immediately and makes the same mistake again. That's a fool. We must identify patterns of behavior. Number two, when making a big decision, this is a good one, spend time praying through your motives. 
When making a big decision, spend time praying through your motives. Now, before we move any further, what are motives? That's a good question. What are motives? Motives are the why behind every what. That's a good way of remembering what motives are. Motives are the why behind every what. When there's a what, there's always a why. In between is your motives. That's what motives are. Our motives are the reason we do something. And whenever we are in a situation to make a big decision, it is so important to monitor our motives, to recognize our motives. In this story, specifically at the end of chapter 14, it is clear that Moses' motives were pure because God's gonna have this conversation with Moses and he's gonna tell Moses, he's gonna say, I could wipe out the entire nation of Israel and I'm gonna restart with you, Moses. We talk about Father Abraham all the time. We could be talking about Father Moses and Moses is like, absolutely not. Lord, allow your mercy to be spread. Allow your glory to be spread through all the nations. Preserve this people. Allow your grace to be manifested in this group of people who don't deserve grace. Moses wasn't about himself. He was about God's glory. He was about God's mercy being shown, about God's uh, glory being displayed throughout the whole world. His motives were centered around God receiving praise. The Apostle Paul reiterates this in 1 Corinthians 10.1. He says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. We've talked about this in the past. Here at this very church, it seems to be a constant theme that we're running up against time and time again. And it's important. Because many of us don't understand the concept of identity. What's my purpose in life? What's my identity in life? There it is. Glorify God. Well, I don't know what that looks like. Find ways to make God known in your life. Glorify him. Austin, I'm directionless. Okay, glorify God in your directionless job that you think you're in right now. Use your job as a platform. Tell people about the Lord. Like, glorify him. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, glorify him. And when we are on the precipice of making a big decision, one of the most valuable things that you and I can do, and I believe this wholeheartedly, is we need to get on our knees, literally. We need to prostrate ourselves before the Lord, and we need to ask God generally, Father, check my motives. If there's any impurity in me, if there's any wickedness inside of me, if there's any selfish ambition inside of me, uproot it, pull it out, and let me walk in your ways. Let me walk in the path that you've laid out for me. God, allow my motives to be your motives. Sync me up with your will. Proverbs 16, 2 says, all the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. The Lord weighs the motives. When we're making a big decision, spend time praying through your motives. Number three, when making a big decision, seek wise counsel from godly people and listen. I need you to see that last part, okay? Um, In fact, let's say it together because it'll be fun. And listen. Let's say it again. That was very weak. Ready? And listen. You got to listen. You got to listen. Again, a foolish person is somebody who seeks out counsel and does nothing with the counsel given. It's not wise. Do you have somebody in your life that you can look up to and ask for advice when you are in a tough or trying moment? Do you have people in your life that can serve as a spiritual mentor to you? That if you're going through something in your life, you can bounce ideas off of them and they will care for you and walk with you. If you don't have a relationship of this kind, you need one. And and, and here's the other thing too, and I... And I, I want to make sure that this is a com- coming across with humility and grace. But I want to address a particular crowd here in our church right now. Um, as a 26-year-old man, I want to talk to people over the age of 50 and specifically men for a quick moment, okay? For whatever reason, the older, I've, I've recognized this, that the older some men get, there is this, um, this idea that everything in life is completely figured out that we have everything figured out, that that we put on the super tough exterior, like we got it sorted. We don't need a guy who can bounce ideas off of. We don't need somebody who can walk with us and coach us. We don't need a mentor. Just because you may be older in life does not mean that you can still learn something from other people in your life. And as a younger man, here's what I want to implore the older men in this church, is to lead by example. Find men to be vulnerable with. I'm not talking being all sappy with your emotions, but recognize that there are areas that you can grow from because we as young men need that. We need it modeled to us. We need a group of men who are willing to recognize that 
Life is constantly this process of progressive sanctification, growing closer and closer and closer with, with God. And if you're not somebody who has somebody in your life who, who can hold you accountable, who can walk with you as a spiritual mentor, who you can ask hard questions to, who can give you advice and correct things in your life that are not right, I want to encourage you to find somebody. I will say at our church here, what is there, like 75 people in this church that are involved in life groups? The over, I mean, it's, it's wild. It's like 70% of our church is involved in life groups. That's incredible. But if you're one of the people that aren't in life groups, you need to get in one because this is where this takes place. This is where those relationships start to be codified and created. And we need to have the humility to be able to walk up to other people and say, hey, I need to learn this. I need to be taught this. I need to be um, walked and guided. And as a young man, here's what I'll say. We need that from the older men. And I will say at our church, fortunately, we have that in a beautiful way with a lot of older men at this church that have just been doing that and I praise the Lord over that. But if you're, if, if you're one of these guys who feels like you got it figured out, you don't and you need to get connected with other dudes. And the same goes for ladies, but I'm just speaking about the men's perspective because I am one, okay? In fact, all throughout the Bible, we see that the movers and shakers in history always had somebody in their life that they looked up to. Moses had his father-in-law. Remember, his father-in-law said, hey Moses, you're having a, a tough time leading the nation of Israel. You need to delegate. And so he listens to his father-in-law and he begins to delegate. Joshua had Moses, Elisha, Elijah. All throughout scripture, we see that the movers and shakers had somebody in their life that they were looking up to, that they were modeling their life after, that they were striving to. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Do we have somebody in our life who's a spiritual mentor, somebody that we are willing to learn from and listen from? Proverbs 18, two says, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. You know anybody like that? They just love revealing what's on their mind. You know, it's just, oh, I'm thinking this and I'm saying it. It's like, okay, well, don't say it. You probably shouldn't think it either, right? We got an issue there. And here's another thing I'll say. If a multitude of counselors is suggesting one thing, but you do the opposite thing. In other words, if you are meeting with wise, godly people in your life and they are suggesting you do X and then you decide in your infinite wisdom to do Y, textbook definition, foolish, It's foolish. You need to listen. You need to take action. And again, we don't want to be fools. We want to be wise. We want to be prudent in everything we do. So that's number three. When making a big decision, seek wise counsel from godly people and listen. Now those are just three quick principles that I wanted to draw our attention to today. But chapter 14 ends with God telling the people that their punishment is going to be wandering in the desert. They're going to wander for 40 years. And then it's very interesting. At the end of chapter 14, God tells them this punishment. And then the people of Israel, uh, in their infinite wisdom, say, you know what, God? We, actually, we want to be obedient to you. We're going to do it. And so they gather up an army. The ark of uh, the tabernacle is still in the middle of the, of the camp. Moses and Aaron are in the middle of the camp. And they gather an army up. And they go, we're going to go take the hill now. And then they charge off and they get slaughtered. They get slaughtered. There are consequences to not making the right choice. There are consequences. There was for the people of Israel and there are for you and me as well, which is why when we are in our Waterloo moments, when we are in these times of our life where a big decision needs to be made, you need to take it seriously. You need to take it seriously. You gotta glorify the Lord in your decision. And so we can't be like the people of Israel. Instead, we need to be like Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua. We need to cultivate a kind of faith that follows God regardless of the giants, regardless of the high walls, and regardless of the obstacles. Because here's the truth, friends. When we have the faith to follow God, he has the faithfulness to protect. Did you hear that? When we have the faith to follow God, we can trust that he has the faithfulness to protect. And he will. Well, Austin, it makes me uncomfortable. Fine. Well, Austin, it makes it scary. Big deal. You think the walls were high for the people of Israel? You better believe they were. Well, Austin, it's really nerve-wracking. I don't know what it's going to mean for us financially. Friends, if God is calling you to do something that maybe doesn't make sense financially initially, but it is clear and obvious that God is affirming you to do this thing, you better do it. He will provide for you. He will meet your needs. He's faithful. 
Psalm 103 verse eight says that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. You may feel alone making a hard decision, but you're not. You gotta lean into the Lord. You gotta press into his love, recognize his compassion, live in his grace. Recognize that he is slow to anger and he is a good, good father, a great listener who cares for you deeply, so much so that he sent his son to die for you. And one more little caveat here that I wanna add is that Maybe some of us look back on our lives and recognize that we've made the wrong decision. There was a choice that we, we made which was not in line with what we should have done. And it was wrong. But the beautiful thing about the gospel and the beautiful thing about Jesus is that in despite of your failures and in despite of your mistakes, Jesus forgives you. He has grace for you. That's the purpose of grace. Grace. That cross wiped away your past sins and he renewed you. And where you're at right now is not too far gone to do something special for you. And that's why when, I know for me, when, when I'm in the middle of thinking through big decisions or, or big things in my life, one of, one of just, I keep coming back to this scene, is Jesus hanging on the cross, looking at his broken body, his tattered body, and recognizing that All of my sins have been forgiven. And what I've experienced in my life is that when I focus on the grace of God and when I survey the wondrous cross, I begin to realize that walking in step with the Lord and following his path is truly the most important thing in my life. And as long as my eyes are fixed on the wondrous cross, I know it's gonna be okay because my purpose is to glorify him in every area of my life. So God is gracious, he's kind to you, and he's abounding in love. So let's consider those big moments. Let's make the right decision. Let's look at the walls and the big giants and not think those are big walls and big giants, but instead think I serve a big God who has power to rip down the walls and take down the giants. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time today. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for Numbers 13 and 14. Father, I pray that we learn something valuable today about the importance of making Choices that are Christ-centered, Christ-exalting, Christ-glorifying. God, I pray that if there's anybody here today who's in the middle of their Waterloo moment, anybody who's in the thick of making a big choice right now, Father, I pray that they would seek your face, that they would have wisdom and discernment, Lord, that comes from you, and may they glorify you in every choice and every decision. Father, we recognize that there are consequences for our actions, Lord, but we also recognize that your grace is abundant, and it's flowing constantly like a river that never will run dry. We love you, Jesus, and we rejoice in the grace that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.